Good morning, everyone. It's great to have you with us again here at King's Christian Centre in Mould. Uh, as you know, I'm Sue. This is Andy, and we're leading our service this morning. Uh, we've got Liz, who's going to preach for us a bit later, and we're also going to take communion together in a little while. So if you want to get your um, bread and your wine or your juice ready, this would be a good uh, opportunity to do it. We've got some songs as well, and as always, we pray that you will meet with Jesus today as you're worshipping with us. That's right, isn't it, And? It is, yeah. And just to remind you, of course, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And uh, since our last um, filming here, uh, there's been a, a major escalation of the situation in Ukraine. And of course, we remember um, all of our friends, all of those people in Ukraine uh, as they face up to the invasion um, by the Russian Federation. So um, I was just wondering and thinking about um, the wisdom that God gives to us. And uh, I, there's a little passage in James that I'd just like to share with you, if that's okay, which leads us nicely into our first song. It says, For where you have self envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness we're going to sing a song um, that is probably uh, one of our favorites in christ alone my hope is found and if you're a little bit worried a little bit anxious about the situation that is developing then call on the name of the lord and uh, in him our hope is found christ alone alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving seems my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of Guilt to life. No guilt 
As we come to pray, our thoughts are full of the situation in Ukraine, and uh, we're going to focus mainly on that during our prayer time this morning. Um, we're going to be using some resources from 24-7 Prayer. There are lots of resources out there. Please have a look on, on, the, on those various websites. Uh, but this is one that particularly struck us as being uh, helpful and useful. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, a prayer for Ukraine. Join in with us if you can. Father God, King of all nations, we cry out to you now for the people of Ukraine. We ask you to rescue those who are vulnerable from the hands of their enemies, that they may live without fear before you all their days. Lord of Lords and Prince of Peace, our politicians are predicting the biggest war in Europe since 1945, and we simply cry out to you urgently to write another story in our time. Thwart the dark machinations of evil men. Give wisdom beyond human wisdom to peacemakers seeking an equitable and less violent way. May politicians exercise the wisdom from above, which is peaceable, gentle, willing to yield and full of mercy. Holy Spirit, we pray for the church in Ukraine, a nation in which 70% of the population call themselves Christian. Give our many brothers and sisters in that nation courage in this crisis that they may proclaim the good news of your kingdom, bind up broken hearts and bring comfort to all who mourn. You, Lord, make wars cease to the end of the earth. You break bows, shatter spears and burn shields with fire. And so we ask you now to save the lives of many people in Ukraine. Make a peace that is strong and not weak. De-escalate this crisis. We hear of wars and rumours of wars, but you, Lord, are our rock, our fortress and our deliverer. Our hope is in you. And so we address the nations now. In the name of Jesus, we say, be still and know God. He is exalted among the nations. He shall be exalted in the earth. We pray all this in the powerful, glorious name of Jesus, our Saviour and our King. Amen. Amen. Well, hello there. Here we are on a Thursday morning. It's our Thursday morning communion service, uh, surrounded by friends. Give everybody a wave. Yep. And we just want to invite you this morning to join with us in taking the bread and the wine, remembering our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, our communion service this morning is being led by Dawn, so she'll be leading us through that. And we just invite you to join with us now in this act of remembrance. As they were eating the Passover meal, Jesus took a loaf of bread and asked God's blessing on it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat for this is my body. So we, if we take the bread now, is that all right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, I shouldn't have done that. No. Uh, 
and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it and he said to them, This is my blood poured out for many, sealing the covenant between God and his people. Let's drink the wine. Oh dear.
And as we come to listen to the word of God now, I'm just going to pray for Liz as she's going to share what God's already given to her for us. Father God, I want to thank you for this lady. I want to thank you that she is a real woman of faith and she's your woman of faith. And I thank you for the word that you've already given to her. And as she comes to speak it out to us now, I pray that she will do that with authority, the authority that comes from your Holy Spirit and that we will listen to it and take on board what you are saying to us. Thank you for all the time and the preparation that she's put into this. And I pray that this will really bless us as we hear what you've got to say for us. Lord, if we're going to be challenged, then I pray that we'll take it on board and we won't lose what you're saying to us today, but that we will act on what you are saying because we love you and we want to grow in you. We want to know you more. So thank you for your word. Thank you that it always speaks to us. And thank you for your Holy Spirit who has impressed on Liz what uh, it is that you're saying to us today. So Liz, I pray that you will speak with all the power and the authority from our almighty God in the power of the Holy Spirit because you love Jesus and we love Jesus too. Amen. Amen, thank you. Well, here we are. And this morning, we're going to look at the story of Esther. Esther's a little book in the Old Testament. She was a queen. Uh, and it's probably a book that gets overlooked, but it's a lovely story. It's got a lot of interesting things in it. And to make it more interesting and a little easier for me, first of all, we're going to watch it as a film strip. It's for the children. It's fun. And I think it will remind you of the story of Esther. God's story. Esther. So part of God's story is about a woman named Esther, and it goes like this. <whistles> Esther was adopted by her cousin Mordecai because her parents died. She and Mordecai were Jewish, which means they were part of God's special family. Our story begins right before Esther becomes queen, and God's family gets in some serious danger. Now, even though Esther was Jewish, she lived in Persia, which was ruled by King Xerxes. One night, King Xerxes wanted to show off his wife, Queen Vashti, at a party. She said no. So he said Vashti could never see him again, and he needed a new queen. So the king invited all the single ladies in Persia to his palace for a year. He decided Esther was prettiest, and she became queen. Really? But as crazy as that sounds, it was a good choice because Esther saved his life. See, one day, Mordecai overheard two guards plotting to kill the king. So he told Esther, and Esther told Xerxes. Around the same time, another powerful man at the palace, Haman, got really mad at Mordecai. He didn't know Mordecai had saved the king's life or that he was the queen's cousin. So he made a rule that all Jews must die. Like we said, he was really mad. And the king let Haman make this law because he had no idea that Mordecai or Esther were Jewish. Well, all the Jewish people were heartbroken but Mordecai thought maybe Esther could save them. She was queen after all. Problem is, only a king could change laws. And anybody who even spoke to the king when he didn't want to listen could die, including Esther. But she was willing to try. She said, if I die, I die. Talk about brave. So Esther visited the king. her relief, he said, what do you want? I'll give it to you. Esther had a plan. Politely, she invited King Xerxes and Haman to dinner. She had saved the king's life. Now she was making a special dinner for him. Xerxes liked that. He said yes. That night, the king asked Esther what she wanted again. And again, Esther invited them to dinner. Haman was thrilled to be invited to dine with the king and queen, twice. But even with this special treatment, he knew he couldn't be truly happy until Mordecai was dead. So he came up with a plan to kill him the next day. But that same day, the king realized that Mordecai had never been honored for saving him. So Xerxes asked Haman how to honor someone. Haman thought the king was going to honor him. Instead, he honored Mordecai. 
So Heyman was already in a bad mood when he got to dinner, but his day went from bad to worse. See, Esther finally told the king that someone made a law to destroy her people. Xerxes was furious and asked, Who dared to do such a thing? Esther told him, it was Haman. Then, the king found out that Haman wanted to kill Mordecai too. Enraged, he ordered that Haman be killed. After that, King Xerxes told Mordecai to make a new law to save the Jewish people. They honored Mordecai and celebrated with a feast. Esther had been willing to risk her life for her people, and she ended up saving them. Like Esther, another rescuer would come one day, and he would actually die to save all of God's special family. And that's the story of Esther. The story of Esther. Agents for redemption. Now, what's the connection between those two statements? Well, we're going to find out because when we were on holiday recently, the story of Esther came back to me. And I've read it and I've read about it and I've taken it to pieces. And today I'm going to tell you not just the story of Esther, but how it works for our lives today. So first of all, we're going to look at where all of this happened. And here you have a map of the Middle East. It's called the ancient Near East because this is how it was in the time of the Persian Empire. And you can see a little dotted line as well as the colors. And that dotted line is the extent of the Persian Empire. So all the way from Egypt on one side, north to uh, Turkey, and across the Caspian Sea, and right round into present day uh, Afghanistan, Kurdistan, Uzbekistan, those countries, and back around the Persian Gulf to what we know as Iran and Iraq. Now we all know the name of Babylon, and you'll see Babylon there in white capitals. And just below Babylon, on one of these turquoise dots, there's the town of Susa, S-U-S-A. And this was the fortress, as you can see, it's near the coast on the Persian Gulf, the fortress town of the ruler of the Persian Empire in 483 BC. And his name was Xerxes. Xerxes I, and he was the son of Darius I. And at the time that this story starts, he was at his fortress in Susa, celebrating how powerful he was, how wonderful he was. And this is his personality. We're going to look at a series, a short series of slides, just telling us about the people involved. And first of all, we have, as I said, Xerxes, the son of Darius I, ruler of the Persian Empire, powerful, ridiculously wealthy, short-tempered, and he liked his wine. He had a queen, and she was called Vashti. She was reputedly very beautiful, known for her beauty. But we also learn something about her character, and that is that she was able to stand up for herself against the king. That was pretty unusual for that, those times, and the result of that was that she lost not her head, thankfully, but her job and she was no longer queen by the end of chapter one. Then we have two protagonists. We have Mordecai, who's a Benjaminite Jew. He opted to stay in Susa when the rest of the Israeli people went back to Jerusalem. There was a number of, of Jews who were comfortable. They had jobs and homes and families. They quite liked their lifestyle and they wanted to stay. And he had a job in the palace. We're not sure exactly what, but he definitely had the freedom of the palace. He didn't return to Jerusalem and he adopted his orphaned cousin, whose Jewish name is Hadassah. Her Persian name is Esther. Her parents died when she was young. We're not told anything more about Mordecai's family, but he did adopt his cousin into his home and brought her up as his daughter. Now at work in the palace, he hid his identity as a Jew. He didn't make a secret of his faith at home, but at work, no, it wasn't talked about. And in the process of his work, he came across some information which saved the king's life. Uh, there are certain things that are like fulcrums within the story. Remember that one, please. He heard something at work that saved the king's life. So let's move on to Hadassah herself. 
also known as Esther. She was, we've said that she's his cousin, he's adopted. She was also a woman of great beauty. And when the king was looking for a new queen, she was put into the, uh, the selection group that were taken to the palace. But we're told something about Esther that's different. We're told that she wins the hearts of all she meets. The man in charge of the harem went out of his way to be kind to her. She had 12 months of beauty treatments before she ever met the king. And ultimately, she became Queen Esther. And then we have the baddie. The baddie is Haman, and he's known as an Agagite. He was a descendant of Agag, who was an Amalekite king. He became, during our story, the chief advisor to Xerxes, again, a very powerful and wealthy position. He had a wife called Zeresh and 10 sons. Halfway through our story, he's appointed as prime minister. But his character, it's not good, you know. He was jealous, he was resentful, and he hated Mordecai. Let's find out what happened, shall we? because the scene is now set for redemption. And so we come to the story. We know where it was, we know when it was, and we know who the main characters are. Now in reading this several times, I concluded that the easiest way to read it is in the message version. If you have a Bible or a device of any kind and you want to find Esther, it's about halfway through the Bible, just before Psalms. But I'm going to tell you the story and maybe just give you a few bits of it from the message version. I'm keeping it chronological. I'll tell you where we are so that if you're following it, you can find it. So obviously we're starting at chapter one. And this first slide gives us chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. And it starts with a drunken party because King Xerxes was so full of himself and his position and his power and his wealth that he wanted to show it off. And <laughs> In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. Everybody was there, the princes, the governors, and for six months, he put on exhibit the huge wealth of his empire. At the end of it, he gave a week-long party, not just for the officials, but for everybody in Susa. And it was so extravagant that he gave everybody their own gold chalice, specially made, with people encouraging them to drink the royal wine. As you can imagine, it got a bit out of hand. And in the uh, high on the wine, shall we say, he decided that he would show off his queen. Now Vashti was running her own ladies party in another part of the palace. That's how it worked in those days, the men and the women. But Xerxes had his own idea. And as you probably know, Eastern women always wore the veil and they may be filmy and gauzy, but they were always covered up. And then she had a crown. And he grabbed two of his servants and he said, go and get Queen Vashti, tell her to put on her crown. I want to show her beauty off to my friends. Hmm. Well, as you might imagine, Vashti did not think that was a good idea. Who would want to do that? It's like putting prize cattle on display. And something within her rose up and she just said, no, I'm not going. Well, as you can imagine, Xerxes was a bit taken aback. He wasn't used to people saying no, and he wasn't used to his queen saying no to him. And he had some terrible advice at that point because the rulers sitting next to him and his officials and the princes, they were all high on wine as well, by the way. They decided that this was just not good enough and an example must be made. The idea they came up with was terrible, but they thought it was great. They said, put out an edict. And by the way, when the queen, the king did an edict with the seal of his ring, nobody could change it. You've heard of the law of the, the Medes and the Persians. This is what it was. It couldn't be broken. Put out one of your edicts and say that all women must do what their husbands say. We'll be the laughing stock if our women start saying no to us all the time. Unfortunately, Xerxes thought it was a good idea. Whether it was 
stamping his authority on it or whether it was the idea that when she'd gone, he could have a new queen. I don't know. But whichever way it went, this is what happened. There was then a search for a new queen. And this is where Esther comes in. I don't imagine she went willingly. I don't know whether any of them went willingly, but a large number of beautiful young women were taken to the palace to be prepared to see the king. 12 months it took. That's rather extreme, don't you see? But you know what happened? King Xerxes fell in love with Esther. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't, oh, she's the most beautiful or she'll do. He fell in love. And at that point, God's plan started to click into place. When we hit chapter three, we found that, that uh, Xerxes appoints a new chief advisor. And this is a guy called Haman, the one I mentioned to you, who was in the royal line from the Amalekites. Now, you might have heard that name somewhere along the road on your Bible journey. I'll remind you about it later on. But what nobody knew was that Haman was a Jew hater. And here he was being put on the king's right hand as his chief advisor when his new queen was a Jew. And the scene is set. The plot thickens. Xerxes is so taken with Haman that he demands that everybody bows to him as he walks around the palace and in and out of the palace and around Susa. But guess who wouldn't? Yeah, Mordecai. Now, the Amalekites and the Jews were old, old enemies. And he decides he will not bow to Haman. And a couple of the people he's working with, they're, they're worried about Mordecai. They don't want his head chopped off. And they say to him, don't do this. What's your problem? Just bow to him. Mordecai says, no, because I'm a Jew. and I only bow to God. Hmm. Fortunately or unfortunately, this message works its way back to Haman. And Haman becomes even more angry and goes to the king. He too wants a decree with the royal seal to wipe out the Jews. And for some reason, Xerxes agrees completely under Haman's spell. They write the decree. They send it out all over the land in every corner, every language. And then they sit down and had a drink. That's what it says. And the city of Susa reeled from the news that the Jews were to be annihilated, executed, not just persecuted, but destroyed. And Esther, I think from the way I read it, was unaware of what had happened there. Remember, she's in the women's court. She only goes to the king when he calls her. She didn't know what Haman had done. She didn't know what Mordecai had done. Mordecai was still somebody that she looked up to and, generally speaking, took his advice. He would go for a walk in the palace gardens and come across Esther and they'd have a conversation. And he had told her quite clearly, don't tell anybody that we're Jews. And she kept to that. So the Jews are shocked. Well, wouldn't you be when you've got a date set where you're going to be wiped out? Is this sending any echoes anywhere to our current situation in, this, in the world where there's a country sitting just waiting? And one of the things the Jews did, you know, when they were distressed like this was they wailed and they wept and they stretched out on sackcloth and covered themselves in ashes. It isn't something we do when we're upset. We might weep and wail, but I've never seen anybody covering themselves in ashes. And as it happens, nobody was allowed into the palace if they were wearing sackcloth and ashes. And when Queen Esther is told by her servants, Hi, Mordecai's outside, he's weeping and wailing and he's lying on sackcloth and he's covered himself in ashes. He can't come into the palace, tell him to stop. He's gonna get into trouble. So she sends him a message. She chews one, one, one of her servants, Haggai, um, who poor man is going like this for quite a while with messages between Esther and Mordecai because he could go into the women's court because he was a eunuch and he could come out and go through the gate and find Mordecai. And the messages went backwards and forwards. What's going on? Well, haven't you heard about the edict to kill the Jews? 
what? And then Mordecai comes up with it. He said, I know, you go to the king and beg for the lives of your people. And she goes, what? I can't just walk into the king. It's not done. I could lose my life. And Mordecai says, who knows, but that for such a time as this, you, a queen, beg the king to save us. Esther said, okay, but you go and you fast and pray and I and my ladies will do the same and then I will go and if I perish, I perish. It's a pretty well-known line. But she was willing to do that. And so a few days later, I think it was a week they fasted and prayed or three days, she put her best clothes on and she went and stood in the outer court where she could see the king and the king could see her, but she had to wait for him to call her in. And he saw Queen Esther and he thought, oh, I haven't seen her for a while. And he held out his, his golden scepter and she walked forward into the presence of the king. He welcomed her and he said, it's good to see you, Esther. What can I do for you? Anything you say, up to half my kingdom. And this is really, really strange what she answered him. This really makes you think that she was listening to God because this is a strange response, a very strange thing. What she said to him was, I would like you and Haman to come to dinner, please. Hmm? And he said, okay, you go get it ready. I'll get Haman in our sort of language. I'm sure she didn't cook it herself. And so they trotted off and had dinner with Esther in her quarters, I assume. <sighs> Haman went home very well pleased with himself that night. Uh, and, but as he went out through the palace gate, there was Mordecai refusing to bow to him. And that got him really cross again. He went home to his wife, who was another one who gave very bad advice, and said, I've been having dinner with the king and queen, but it means nothing because that man will not bow to me. And his wife says, hmm, I've got an answer for you. Build a gallows and then ask the king if you can execute Mordecai because he's not bowing to you. He's not keeping the edict. It's straightforward. And Haman thought that was quite a good plan. But in between dinner one and dinner two, not only did the gallows go up, Xerxes had a bad night. He couldn't sleep, couldn't sleep at all. And in that sleeplessness, what can I do? He got somebody, one of his scribes, one of his servants, to read to him the record of his reign. And in there was a little bit about Mordecai and how he'd overheard a plot to assassinate the king. He told Esther, who told Xerxes, and the plot was foiled. So he had, in effect, saved the king's life. And the king had forgotten all about it. And he went, what? Well, what did we do for Mordecai? Because honouring somebody who'd saved your life was really quite high up on what you should do in those days. And lo and behold, Mordecai becomes a hero. <laughs> and when Haman comes to work the next day, full of, King, you've got to let me execute Mordecai, he comes into the, king, the king's court to have the king say to him, I need your advice, Haman. I need to reward somebody who's done a very great favour to the king. What do you think we should do? And Haman thinks, oh, he's talking about me. Who else would the king want to honour? It must be me. And he says, oh, you should do this and you should do that and you should put your cloak on him, put him on your horse, you should lead him round the town and have hail to this man who saved the life of the king. And the king said, great idea, Haman. I want you to do that for Mordecai. Oh dear, he really didn't like that. But you know, he had no choice. So he had to do that very thing and put his enemy in the place of honour and walk around hailing him as a hero. Well, he went home after that 
and his face was, oh, he was not happy. But while he was sitting moaning to his friends, his sons and his wife, the servants came to get him. Hey, the king and queen are waiting for you. It's that second dinner, remember? So he scurries off to the palace, has the dinner, and the king says again, Esther, what can I do for you? Anything you ask, even to half my kingdom. And she turns around and she says, I need you to help me because there's somebody who wants to get rid of me and my people. They are threatening my life. We've been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, sold to be massacred, eliminated. If we'd just been sold into slavery, I wouldn't have brought this up, but destroyed, please can you help? King Xerxes exploded. Who, he said, where? This is monstrous. Who's trying to destroy my queen and her people? At which point Esther told him she was a Jew. And obviously he knew that Mordecai was her uncle, a Jew. He was furious. He couldn't believe his ears. He said, who is it? Who is it? And Esther said, it's him sitting right there, Haman. Haman went a bit pale. The king got up and stormed out into the garden. He needed to cool down. His hot temper was showing again, raging. He stomped out into the palace garden. While he was out there, Haman threw himself on his knees in front of Queen Esther, who was reclining on her couch, which is how they were lying those days, even as they were eating. Begged her to save his life, to spare his life. He hadn't intended to hurt the queen, etc., etc. At which point, while he's groveling on his knees in front of the queen's couch, Xerxes comes back in and sees Haman sprawled in front of his queen. And that is the last straw. And he grabs him, sends one of his servants, and he says, get rid of this man. And the servant says, if you look out the palace, sire, you can see the spike he's put up. He wanted to put Mordecai on it. It's 75 feet high. You can see it from here. And the king said, hang him on it. So Haman was hanged on the very gallows that he had built for Mordecai. And the king's anger was satisfied. Hmm. Next day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate from Haman. And Mordecai came before the king and said, what are we going to do now? Because you've done one of those seals, laws that can't be broken to kill the Jews. How can we, get, how can we change this? And the king said, I'll give him a ring. You write another edict. I can't rip that one up. I'm not allowed. But you can write another one changing it. So this is what they did. They wrote an edict which similarly went out everywhere and said, the Jews have the right to defend themselves and to plunder their persecutors. And off they went again with this message. When Mordecai walked out of the king's presence, he was wearing a royal robe of violet and white, a huge gold crown, a purple cape of fine linen, and the city of Susa exploded with joy for the Jews. It was all good times and laughter. They celebrated. They were honoured everywhere. At that point, you were safer to be a Jew than not. And so the day came that had been appointed by the edict to destroy the Jews and the Jews defended themselves and they didn't die and their enemies were forever wiped out. And here's two things that I find very interesting. They didn't take the plunder from their enemies. They just destroyed them. And you may say, why is that important? But you see, Esther and Mordecai were actually completing something that God had ordered many, many years before. If your history will take you back to the times of Joshua, they were told to destroy the Amalekites and they were fooled, if you remember. And there was some trouble about buried plunder as well. And if you roll forward a bit to King Saul, he too had troubles with the Amalekites. And he too 
didn't destroy what he was told to. And we have this little verse that said, do I hear the sound of lowing? Oh, it's for the sacrifice, said King Saul. Well, I'm afraid that didn't work because God had given him an order and he disobeyed. And so, in fact, on that day, when the Amalekites under Haman and his ten sons and his family and his followers and the other people who hated the Jews were destroyed, finally, God's edict was carried out. And to this day, the Jews have a feast every year called Purim. And they remember what Esther did. There's one more thing that's interesting here. The book of Esther has 10 chapters, but we do not see the name of God mentioned here in this book at all. And the author seems to be making a point that God can work through the decisions of everyday people, even if they themselves are somewhat morally ambiguous, like not telling people of their faith. God is still in control and his plans cannot and will not be thwarted. Though time runs by and years go, God's way, God's will will come to pass. We have lessons to learn here. And I'm going to read you something from a devotional I read on the, on the book of Esther. The story of Esther deals with a very important theme and one that is good for us to dwell on regularly. We live in a messed up world. We do, don't we? And it is often hard to see where God is in all the chaos and the mess. True. We say, as Christians, that God is good. So why is there so much evil? We say, God is in all of this. He is love. So why is there war? We say God is in control. So why does it sometimes feel like the enemy is winning? We can have hope when we see God at work. Throughout the book, there's been glimmers of hope, signs that God has not been absent, but rather orchestrating the world events as a whole. Am I getting any echoes here of current days? It's strange, isn't it, the timing of this? There were things that were hard. There were things that went wrong. But the little things that seemed unimportant at the time suddenly became the fulcrum for God to move the pieces and work things out according to his plan. Esther risked her life to save her people. Jesus gave his life to redeem us. Redemption, finally, we get there. Redemption cannot be earned. Now, you may get vouchers you can redeem for free offers now and then. You may hear the word used in a completely different context occasionally. Like I read the other day that Lewis Hamilton had got to redeem himself by going back to be in the races this year. Can't quite see where that fits in with redemption. But redemption, even in the dictionary, speaks specifically and exclusively about God redeeming people from their sins through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That's what it says in the dictionary. And I want to read you, as I close, some verses from the New Testament, which put this brilliantly. This is Ephesians chapter 2, and the first eight verses. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by, by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as he has shown us in all he has done 
for those hearts who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. So, if we are agents of redemption, like Esther and Mordecai were, are we willing to take risks? We too live in a morally corrupt world. Do we live our lives by God's standards? Do we spread the aroma of Jesus around wherever we go? Are we truthful? Are we kind? Are we generous? Do we hide our identity as the people of God? Am I an agent for redemption in a lost world? God overturned the destruction of a people by the actions of two Jews, a young, beautiful girl who was given a position of power, not of her asking, and her uncle, whose wisdom was based in his faith and his knowledge of God. What about us? What can we do for God if we are available? Will you be an agent of redemption? In your family, in your neighbourhood, in your work, in your school, in the marketplace, or in any position that God puts you in that gives you some influence, will you be an agent for redemption by taking Jesus with you wherever you go? And of course, the start of that is that you accept Jesus for yourself as saviour because of what he did on the cross for you. Thank you, and I hope that you really think this through and decide if you want to be an agent for redemption. Well, how available are you to God then um, for all that he's got for you and all that he's purposed uh, for your life? And it's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? And it's a challenge not just uh, for you, but for all of us. Um, how available are we? Um, so maybe you want to take that away and chew over that and come back to Liz as she's preached that this week or, or to ourselves or to anybody else uh, in the leadership team or anyone else that you trust as a Christian. So we just want to say thank you ever so much for joining in with us th today. Thank you for opening your device. Thank you for sharing. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed sharing in the, in the bread and the wine. Uh, that's always a really wonderful experience, isn't it? And uh, hearing the word of God. So um, we uh, pray that you've uh, know, got to know Jesus uh, a bit more uh, through this service. Uh, there are resources on our website which you can use uh, to help grow your faith uh, and to find out more. So thank you for being with us. Is that right? That is absolutely right. Yes, and I think we end by saying the grace together, shall we? We do. So if you know the words, please join in with us at home. May the, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Goodbye and God bless you. Take care.